Hi there, Mr. Automation. Um, today with a video on performance metrics on Windows. Um, so basically, um, we're going to use some PowerShell for this. No, not C Sharp or anything, just some simple shell scripting. Um, so we're going to investigate the get counter. It's a command that gets information from the system. We're going to look at CPU, memory, network, and disk. Um, let's share my screen. So get counter. So with counter you can get uh, performance uh, metrics from the Windows subsystem. Windows has a rich su subsystem that monitors and keeps track of performance. And you can live tap into those counters and get values back. So basically that's what we're doing. So first we get to the manual of the get counter. And basically it accepts a counter as an input. And then you can specify sample interval, some max interval, so how many samples you want to capture. Perhaps you want to monitor the CPU for like, I don't know, 10 seconds or 10 iterations, and then you get like a whole list. Uh, I'll show how that works in a second. You can even do it continuous. See that? So there's also sort of continuous monitoring there involved. And you can even specify a computer name. But I don't think you can specify credentials here. So if you want to reach out to a computer remotely and you don't, uh, you cannot use the credentials where you currently log in to your own system, then you cannot reach out remotely. With this, then you need another approach and you need to wrap an invoke command that accepts credentials and then runs this remotely. Um, uh, perhaps I'll discuss those scenarios, I'm not sure. Um, I'll, at least I'll show you how it works, okay? So, uh, get counter, list set star. So basically this lists, I don't know only this, all the counters we have available on the operating system, right? It's a lot. Search index, so you see that already. If I pipe that to a, a grid view, as I do now, you will see this uh, grid view. And um, here you have a counter set name. See that? You have lots of them. You can sort on name, of course. Perhaps that makes it easy. And for instance, we're looking for the... Uh, uh, processor, right? I think we started with that one. Let's see if that's the case. Yeah, CPU info. So uh, let's check here for uh, CPU or processor, I think. Processor. Because I know a little bit how this works under the hood. I used it uh, ages ago already on Windows XP, I think it was, or even on NT4. It was already there in the operating system. Um, so uh, that's a long time ago. Um, go to uh, processor here, right? And if you click on this processor, you see here the pods. Basically, you're interested in this name only. So let's uh, dig a little bit into this processor uh, counter, right? Size it up a little bit, perhaps that's better. I'm not sure. Hang on. Like this. So this processor. Yes, I want to have a look inside of the processor time specifically, right? How much time it's consuming. Um, so let's go back to the uh, code editor. We know it's called processor. What you can do then is you can also do a get counter list set still star, right? But you can also pipe that to uh, where, and I think it's counter set name. Counter set name, not 100% sure. Uh, equals processor. I think it was that. Let's see if we get something back. Yes. So it was counter set name. Um, and I can see that here, of course, this is the name of the header, counter set name equals processor, right? So we're now interested in this. So, and here we can see what's inside of it. And here you have a property counter. So what you can do here, if you have that, uh, that one available, you can pipe that again uh, to uh, select. I said select and then uh, counter. And I think we need to expand that even because I think there's a lot of that, a lot of information in there, I mean. So let's run this. And now basically here, you get a list back of all the supported uh, counters uh, that the processor uh, holds, right? We're now only looking at the processor type, so to speak. And here you have a processor time, percentage processor time. But basically, um, by the way, I made this video on request of a viewer and he asked me to collect some information from a system and even remotely. So uh, this is uh, why I created this video. And so let me continue. So the processor information was one of the things he, uh, he, he asked for, if he can monitor that. So let's uh, go a little bit down because I prepared it a little bit, not making it too scary. Do it bit by bit. Hang on. 
take the, uh, the next line. So basically what we're doing here on line seven now here, we're storing in a variable CPU the counter of this pr proce total processor time, right? It was this one, we retrieved that, right? And basically we do a sample of one and a max sample of one. So I only take one sample and I'll just show you uh, how that looks. So when I run this, take some time and then inside of CPU, we now have some information. So when I type CPU, you now have some information here. You see that? Timestamp when it was uh, measured and the value here. And this value looks, looks a little bit crappy and, and it is, but you can uh, zoom in. So if you have the CPU, you also have, you see that on top here, counter samples, you know, it's a object oriented shell. So you can do dot counter samples. And then all of a sudden it looks a little bit better, right? You see from which processor, for instance, yeah, you have multiple perhaps, or, um, you see a lot of, uh, a lot more there. Um, here with the cooked value, this is basically the value of the CPU time. So if you even want to go further, cooked samples, of counter samples dot cooked value, right? And then here you have the exact amount of CPU time uh, that was measured when we run this command. Of course, it's like a one time, right? You run that command and you store that information. If you want to get the information again, you need to run the command again, of course, right? You can stick a loop around this, you know, while loop and then measure the information. If there's enough time, we do that. Uh, so I hope you get the principle a little bit. So let's go to memory. It's basically the same principle again. So what I did to get here, so to speak, oh, I don't want any noise on the screen. So basically what I did here was the same. I get the counters again, right? In this grid view. And then I search for, uh, I think it was memory, memory, if I can type. And then I found this one, memory, see available bytes, you know, available committed bytes. So that's the amount of memory you have assigned on your machine. So I thought this is was uh, is uh, correct is the correct one. So what you do then again you get those uh, counters from here right memory committed bytes for instance that's one Let's scroll a little bit to the right memory committed bytes you see that here exactly that name with the forward slash. So basically you get here that counter and then you get uh, information back. Now let's check inside of memory what we have. And you can do the same again memory dot counter samples. Right, dot cooked value, right, you understand? And in there, it's in bytes. So if you want to uh, divide that, you can, for instance, do it like this, right? And you have the megabytes. So currently I have 16 gig in use. Well, it could be the case, so uh, that's fine. I'm not really tapping into the correctness of this video, you know, I just show you how it works and uh, the calculations and such, and, and uh, you need to do that on your own. Um, so let's go to the next. So now we go to the network interface, same principle. Again, I did where the counter set equals or something like the network, right? I got that from this uh, so overview again, right? Network, network, and I found something here in the network interface, I think it was. And then, yeah, and on the interface, you have this counter, bytes per second, right? You see that here again, that's here. Total bytes per second, you see that? And we have that now here. And also we get one sample there. So I'll stick that inside of Nick, the Nick variable. Let's look inside of Nick. And uh, I have multiple Nicks, but can, can be the case. So again, we can go to counter samples and then you get an overview. You see, I have two network interface there and that's correct because uh, I have two there. And again, you can go to the cooked value, of course, cooked value. And there you see that one of the interfaces is not using anything and the other one was a little bit busy. See that? There was some bytes. This is in bytes, so there's not much. Um, I could st start streaming a video, for instance, you know, to the internet or download something and then you will see this, of course, going up. Um, let me take the disk. Same principle, you know, with the get counter in the grid view. I sorted and I found out that this is the correct counter, right? And I take one sample again. So let's look what's inside of disk, which is disk. Let's look inside of disk. And use your imagination, of course, if you want to use different performance counters, right? Just tap into the object like this, right? Like, like we did here, right? Specifically, and this is the processor, but you can tap into any one, of course. And then you expand the property counter, right? I do that again. And then you can actually see what's all supported. And basically these literal values that you see here, right? Any one of those, 
you can provide that here inside of the counter name. And that's basically how it works under the hood. And you can do this for many, many others. You know, if you do the list set, then you can see every performance counter that is available. And uh, if you install SQL Server, for instance, you get a lot of performance counters on top. If you say, you'll install Hyper-V, you know, and you, you get the picture. So those performance counters can be uh, quite huge. Um, very rich as well. That's my experience. Um, so yeah, that, that's it basically for getting uh, the values. Uh, but now it's kind of a messy script, you know. Imagine we would run this. I just do it for the sake of the demo. Imagine we run this and we mimic this behavior there. So we only pr provide the cooked values for now. Disk, not cooked value as well. Oh, hang on. So for instance, this is a wonderful script that is just run and now it spits out some values. And this is nasty, of course, because it makes no sense, right? If you look here and you don't know what, what is this, what is this zero? What is this? Uh, we happen to know that this is the network interface. We just inspected that, but it makes no sense, right? This data yet. So uh, let's give it some extra time and make it a little bit more advanced. So hang on a little bit. Yeah, so let's make it a little bit more interesting. So uh, I'll need to resize the screen a little bit as well, um, because otherwise you can't see any values, I think. So let's now run it and I just only get the counter samples back, okay? So I'll run only this part. Now at least you get an overview. So the total processor time total was the cooked value. And of course you can do a selection here, you know, select the path and the cooked value only, you know, so you don't need this instance name for instance. So it's a little bit more concise, the overview. Um, you get a picture there, I think. So this is the information now uh, quite nicely stored already, right? It's, it's in a kind of a nice format. So what we can do, we can, for instance, uh, we don't need this all this top stuff. This is more for investigation. So we, uh, you know, we investigated first and now we know that this works. So what we can do is a while uh, true, for instance, while true. Open and close, and then while true, every time we get the CPU sample and the memory sample and such, and then uh, we stick this inside of the loop as well. And uh, I always advise to start sleep or some intelligence at least uh, inside of a loop that it don't consume all your uh, all your resources. Right? If you do a while true and you don't do any sleeping, then it's it's going to be heavy for your system, I can tell you that. Uh, so basically, when we run this now, now every time, we get every four seconds, basically, for around that time, because it also takes some time, of course, to get this inf actual information from the operating system. And then we echo it to the screen, so to speak, right? You show the overview below here, and then we sleep for four seconds. So let's clear the screen. Let's run this code. Uh, I will remove the side panel for now. Let's see what we get back because I don't see anything yet on the screen. Yeah, there it's popping up. It's not very nice, of course, but let's see in four seconds or about something like that. You see another overview. So you see different values here, for instance, for the processor time is now different than the previous measurement, right? It was 4% in use. And now it was only 3% in use. And uh, here you see the disk, right? The disk activity and such. Um, still, the overview is not very nice, of course. You can uh, customize this, right? You create your own object, for instance. I created plenty of videos for that. And perhaps we do that for the sake of this demo. Uh, it's not that hard. So basically, what you can do, I stop the code here. You can also. Um, sort of make a proper format. So let, let's create a prop. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm creating an empty hash table. We can uh, use that later. I need to assign it by the way, empty hash table. And now we can do some uh, nice stuff there. So for instance, we call it CPU equals and do CPU counter samples dot uh, cooked value it was, right? Cooked, cooked value, yes. And um, and we can combine this out and we can do sort of the same here. We uh, measure the memory as well. The memory equals uh, mem, mem dot counter samples 
samples samples I said dot good value and we can do the same for the nick and we can of course be lazy as well we can copy this over a little bit nick equals that dot cooked value cooked value I said and then we do the same for the disk it's kind of boring I guess to see me doing this but you can speed up the video if you're watching so uh, we call this disk and I need to indent that properly and we assign that and a counter samples disk dot cooked value as well so now we don't need this here anymore right we now have this property and what we can now do is a new object uh, object ps object minus uh, property and then we stick in our uh, hash table there right and now we get to sort of uh, i don't know how it looks by the way so perhaps it can still be crap but uh, let's see it should be a little bit more clear than the previous example uh, so let's see what we get okay I'm running this now. Let's see what kind of output we get. See, it takes some time to get those counters. Actually, I don't know why it takes up so much time, but at least now you see your memory and which nick and the value and still not very nice CPU and disk, but at least you have some columns, right? It's a little bit more uh, easy to read, I think, but uh, it's from my perspective, of course. Uh, perhaps we can even fancy this a little bit more, so hang on. And the overview is not correct, by the way, because I don't see the memory here on the left side. So and I, th I made a typo here. I did me, and me is nothing, but mem is, right? Because we stored that here on top. So let's just output one object. Let's see how it looks. Okay, that looks better. So the memory in use in bytes was this. The nicks, we have two nicks. One of them was using zero bytes. The other one was uh, using 570, uh, something like this, bytes. This is the CPU usage, right? And all my disks were actually idle. We were on zero, so it could be, I'm not doing anything heavy, so it could be. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit uh, better overview, I think. And uh, let's run it and let's pause it for like two seconds for each iteration. Let Run it a couple of times and then you have like a, a picture, I think. And then we do it remotely against the remote machine as well. And then I think the video is uh, done. So let's run this again. I could pause the video, of course, and then, but you can fast forward, I guess, uh, if you uh, don't want to watch this. There you see it. We have two times the memory now. We have the network interface and the CPU. You see that it's changing there from 5 to 3% to 3.98%. So, see? And the same for the disk. You see that well, uh, the disk was at some point it was not using anything. And now here you see pl plenty of usage, right? On the disk, on both disks. I have a couple of them. I have exactly four of them. Two of them are, are idle. And these ones are quite. Uh, active currently, as you see, and your CPU, memory usage, uh, network. You see that? That's using also almost one megabit. Wow. So um, yeah. So let's stop this, and let's open Paint. Um, you know my painting skills are not the best. I guess this is what we have for now. Uh, so I imagine uh, you have a remote server now, right? So here we have a server and it's a Windows box, by the way. This doesn't work on Linux, uh, by the way. So it's a Windows server here and it has the same, all these counters, you know, you can get those counters remotely from a system. And I'm sitting here now on the Windows uh, box as well. It's also Windows. And uh, I'm sitting here on my computer, right? This is my gaming PC. I'm actually standing behind it, by the way. And uh, we're going to reach out then remotely to that Windows server. And I have my hypervisor running, so we're going to use that as an example. We're going to reach out and get the counters now remotely and also display them uh, uh, here. So I'm running here, right? I'm sitting here. The code runs over there. And then we get the information back here again. And then we can look at this counters information as if it were local. But there are some requirements, for instance, here you can have a firewall, right? If you have a firewall, you need to open some ports. And specifically for PowerShell, it's uh, 
is 185. That's, uh, by the way, non-encrypted. And this is 86 in the end, 59, 86. I'm using a mouse, by the way, so it's terrible. 59, uh, uh, 86, 80 is this. This is uh, uh, HTTPS, so it's secure. But you need to open that, otherwise you cannot reach out to that remote system. Okay, so um, now I reach out to my remote system. So hang on, I'll share that in a second. Uh, let me open it here. Get it to this screen here. So on, now we have on this server, right? I have here also CPUs and such and such. You see, I have a lot of network interfaces. I have more memory here, by the way, and more CPUs. As well. I don't know if I have more, but I have a lot of CPUs here. So uh, the system is quite idle, by the way. It doesn't matter. It's not used, uh, heavily loaded currently. It's doing nothing, actually. And um, so now we're going to change the script a little bit. So imagine now we have a, a server name, server name, equals, uh, you saw that already, it was called hvo2, and that's my server name. And now you can also specify here minus computer name, and then we stick in our uh, server name, okay? And we do that for all these commands. Uh, I need to show one more thing before I continue in this, in this crappy drawing. I'm sitting here, of course, and I'm logged in with some credentials, right? I have some credentials here. I have that loaded and I'm sitting here on my machine and I'm working as my user. But when you reach out to a remote system, it's using the credentials where you are logged in with, so to speak. So if you, if with those credentials, you're not able to reach out to there. So for instance, you are not an administrator, for instance, and you don't, uh, um, then you cannot run these commands most probably. Uh, so you need to have permissions there. If you don't have permissions, then you need to wrap credentials even around this uh, and perhaps we do that even, I don't know. Uh, let's see, perhaps we can also discuss that scenario. It's not that complicated. Um, so we go back now to here, and now basically we run the same code, but now it's reaching out to a remote server, and it gets that information back from us, so for us, I mean. Run it again, a little bit of patience here. Fast forward if you don't want to wait. You see, and now we're doing it remotely. But basically, now we're getting it back from that remote system. And perhaps uh, that's nice for the demo, for instance. So now this is a little bit richer, right? So now we also have a server name. Server name uh, equals, uh, we stick our server name in there, right? Just for the overview. Looks a little bit better. I even could have done that with the uh, local machine as well when we run it on the local system. But now we're reaching out remotely, so it makes sense that you have the computer name there, there I think. So, uh, Let's run it again, and let's clear the screen first. For the sake of cleanness, run it again. You see now, we have a bit more properties now, by the way, we have one property more, so then it's not displayed anymore in a, in a table, but sort of in a, in a different view. It doesn't matter, still you get the same information back. You see that the disk, uh, which server it runs, the network interfaces, memory usage, CPU usage, you see, and it's now running remotely. And um, imagine the scenario that you don't have, uh, a little bit more complicated by the way, but it doesn't matter. Imagine you don't have this scenario available. You can also do an invoke uh, command, minus, uh, I think it's computer name, minus computer name, then again we do our server name, minus script block. So basically open and close that stick everything inside of there. So basically move that up. You don't need to specify the computer name anymore because you're already reaching out to that system now. So I'm now uh, preparing a scenario where you don't have credentials from your local system to reach out to that remote system. And then still we do the same here. We still do the same, we do that also. And also the returning of the object. We do that all inside of that remote uh, command. And for server name, uh, we basically don't need to provide that now. I'll show you a trick in a second. Uh, don't make it too complicated, I guess, to start with. So let's uh, try to run this now on this remote server, but still, still, in the end, in this, on this invoke command, we still need to provide credentials, right? So you have a minus credential there as well. And uh, we can do lazy, we can do get credential here. Get 
that show, right? You can do that there, and then it's, it asks you every time. So you can also store that, right? You create a credential variable, and you call that, I mean, equals get credential, and then we store it there, and then we specify that here, okay? Correct. Uh, okay. So let's see. Uh, let's size this up. Let's move that. Let's see. Uh, server name. You can execute something when we need to have credentials there. And I honestly don't know if this is going to work because you see me doing this sort of live, right? And I run this. Uh, I have to debug it on, by the way, on purpose. And I press F10 here. And first we store the credentials. And here it says the username. And I have a username. It's an administrator. If I can type administrator and we have a password for that users yes so now inside of credentials let's see if we have something here actually yeah we have something here so now basically we can use that credentials to remotely execute on that server still the same commands right but they run locally so this invoke command basically is doing the remoting now so if you need alternate credentials you need to use this approach otherwise you can uh, use the previous approach i'll show you um i can basically uh Stop this now. This one credentials we already have in memory, so I comment it out. Otherwise, I keep entering that. I don't like that for now. And now I run it again. Let's see if we get actually something back. I don't know. Perhaps I made a mistake. Now it's running. You see, it's on a remote machine. Even you get the run space ID back there. So that 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 works certainly. And uh, there you have it. Right, CPU, disk, and. Um, the server name we didn't need to provide because I already knew when you run a command remotely, you always get the PS computer name back. And that is the remote computer. Otherwise you had server name and the PS computer name. So that's sort of the reason why I commented that out. Um, let me think of another scenario because I think sort of this is it. And use your imagination, of course, just add another counter here, add another property here, stick those same counter samples cooked values inside of there. And you have a different counter uh, you can measure, so to speak, so performance counter, I mean. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, see you in one of my other videos.